the winning, the secret winning card of how aggro decks beat a lot of things, honestly. We see it very much highlighted in Priest. You see it to an extent in the aggro taunt druids that you, we've not really seen in Europe. But, you know, adding it to Hunter or making sure it's in Hunter does the same job, right? We did a lot of play testing where your Divine Shield placements as the aggro deck gave me yes. a very hard time as Warlock, for example. So it's just something I do like to, to, to see in Hunter as well as these other decks you see it a little bit more commonly in. So good build there for, Ra uh, for Radu just in terms of what he's expecting to face but this matchup in itself is very very scrappy and I feel at least Sol that as long as the priest can just get on board reasonably early it's going to be feeling pretty great because it generally gets to value trade a lot in this one. Yeah, uh, a couple of interesting mulligans there as well. Uh, RDU had a hand with a plan. Uh, weapon on one, Mancrick and the Rhino. Obviously, weapon plus Rhino is a very lethal combination, particularly in board-based matchups, right? Because you're able to push a lot of damage while controlling the board very effectively as well with a double-dipping rush minion. Probably too slow and too ambitious to keep in the matchup through the Rhino away, but got it replaced with aim shot, which is, if anything, a little bit worse even in the matchup overall. Uh, Casey had kind of the nutso gandling hand on coin with a uh, desk imp in hand already and threw away the gandling again same mentality right knowing he's up against the other most aggressive deck in the format was looking to seize board fast seize board early and never let go of it yeah and this is just looking great right the the Felmore obviously quite delayed when it comes out. It can still make some great trades, even if it goes into, say, the 1-4 on the board. It can still get a good job done. RDU's going to clean it up, but just saving the Desk Imp to do the, the zero-cost coin into Traveling Merchant is really powerful because Casey just gained that 4-5 before the Felmore's even become a thing, and he gets an additional turn with it now before the Felmore pops out and potentially snipes it. So very, very strong overall, even though this turn is a bit of a weaker one for Casey, just have, picking up that Vracious Reader, which isn't really going to achieve too much for now. The attack with the weapon on the previous turn from RDU was extremely interesting to me, though, and I mean that in the true sense of the word. Um, because he chose to attack into a 1-4, which then sent the Mancrick plummeting into the 1-4 as well, right? Which seems like it makes a lot of sense on the surface, and I think it absolutely does make a good amount of sense. Um, but what that opened up is because the Mancrick had one damage on it, it then meant that the tour guide plus a hero power, or sorry, the desk imp plus a hero power was then able to take it down. Whereas if you just hit the desk imp, there's then a four health minion still with only a one attack minion on the other side, which makes it more difficult to hero power down. Obviously that got punished very specifically by tour guide because otherwise paying two for a hero power, probably just a little bit too inefficient from Casey. So I'm certainly not calling that out as a mistake. I just thought it was an interesting little dynamic to look at that turn. And this is a tough turn for Adu as well. He was hovering over the piercing shot just for a second at the start. And naturally, I would want to see Cult Neophyte Hero Power trade here. Mm. And I think I still like it because Casey has a zero mana Hero Power locked up, right? Because he played two tour guides. But if you make him use it on this, then I think that's very, very fine here. I am surprised at this turn, though. Wow. Using quick okay. shot to kill a 1 1, saving the weapon. That's crazy. That, however, is also crazy, but in a very different meaning of the word for Casey, as he picks up not only a one-mana card, but a one-mana card that protects his voracious reader going into this turn. But RDU clearly massively valuing his own weapon charges for board control, right? For If he picks up additional minions, that gives, essentially it gives every minion in his deck rush, right? That's what that weapon does. We talk a lot about the specific interaction with Rhino, but it's also great for just overall board control. And I think that's what RDU is valuing there by using the quick shot, but certainly not gonna argue that it doesn't look bizarre, right? To quick shot mm. a one one in that position. And again, though, this point out, just look how awkward this divine shield is now. Right, yep. he can swing into it and then piercing shot if he wants to. That's a fine play, follows up with the Wolpertinga as well. But we just saw him use a quick shot because he didn't want to swing a weapon for nothing into something, and now I think he just has to. Well, I think when you, if you want to break it down, I think when he doesn't use the weapon, it's not that he just doesn't want to use the weapon forever, right? It's that he wants to use the weapon charges to deal with more important minions, of which there are many in the uh, in the deck. There's, of course, the Void Touch Attendant, the Voracious Reader, all of those kind of things. Gandling, if it needs to be taken care of at some point. 
So yes, he's not happy about it. It's not a good Hearthstone turn by any means, but I think you know dealing with a Voracious Reader is much more essential than, it, than dealing with a Desk Imp. Power! Is he just gonna say go? Okay, he blinks. <laughs> Weird card to play the Void Touched in this matchup because obviously the Hunter has what well, wants to do a very similar job as the Shadow Priest here, and that Void Touch works both ways. So this Hero Power would do one more, the minion, the weapon, so on, so on. Just gotta be Walpatinga, right? Yeah. Yep. You would imagine so. Yeah. That has to be, if not the best, very close to the best draw in the deck. For RDU, allows him to clean up the Void Touch Attendant, allows him to clean up the Neophyte by getting the buff on the Wolpertinger, and then he's actually dropping a huge amount of tempo down with the 3-2 uh, Wolpertingers as well. He passing. Kind of funny, right? Because no he's because he's winning on board, the Void Touch is a benefit for him, right? He's just pushing more damage. I kind of like this, honestly. Whoever's got the most minions gets the most out of Void Touch, even though RDU's far behind, but it's a way RDU can catch up as well. It's true. He does, what, 17 next turn if this Void Touch lives? Just with hero power, sorry? Assuming everything else lives, of course. What's Casey looking at here? I mean, I think Alusia is the dynamic he's thinking about. I don't think he's necessarily thinking about playing it this turn. But he's, uh, for example, considering just leaving the Voracious Reader in his hand as a card that he passes over to his opponent, because we know how awkward that is when your opponent has the... Uh, the Alusia in, uh, sorry, the uh, the Voracious Reader in their hand in when you swap over with Alusia because they don't even want to play it at that point, being that it draws cards for you. But at the same time, he does want to dump cards out of his hand because he's probably looking at a board swing with Alusia at some point if RDU is going to leave cards stranded in his own hand as well. So, in a perfect world here, RDU would piercing shot this turn, right? If he's ever uh, thinking what? about Alusia. Oh, I see. Okay. Because he, she, because uh, Casey can't play the Rhino as well, but he could play Pearson Shot. Sure. And you do start to get small reads, right? When Priest has had like has floated mana so often. I think that's two turns in a row. Casey's floated one, and he's had a hat card in his hand for what, three, four, five turns now. Share your thoughts with the class now. Or we have to go piercing shot on the Rhino makes sense. You have to push a ton of damage, but is it going to be enough? Can I do you just catch up here? Yeah, it looks like you're right. Like even with this kind of mediocre hand, it's still just a lot of stuff. He can choose to play out the uh, Twilight Deceptor just as a two-three without picking up the additional value out of it, or he can uh, he can can actually look for Raise Dead and potentially play those minions out of his own hand himself. It's just whether the damage becomes a problem at that point. But either way, he's going to be winning the board massively. And yeah, I think this is a good decision. Yeah, I, I think from RDU. Yeah, I think two 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 here is fine, right? Play the two two drops and hero power push damage go. He could potentially kill the Alusha. I wouldn't hate it because it means that he's on an awkward break point for hero powers. Agreed. Oh, that's there's the concede anyway. Casey knows it's not going to be enough. And RDU takes game number one with the Face Hunter. And uh, there goes Shadow Priest for Casey. Remember, just a reminder, last hero standing, which means Casey's Priest is gone. RDU is going to be queuing up that Hunter once again. So uh, a great win there. It was looking dicey. RDU was on the back foot for a long time there. He was, but I do think that is emblematic of the way the matchup goes as well, is that, yes... Priest can grip the board early, right? Like sometimes they just have slightly more efficient answers in the early game because of uh, they play a 1-4 on turn one, for example, which is bigger than anything a hunter can play. Zero mana hero powers being targetable. You know, it's essentially they're halfway through the uh, the quest hunter quest <laughs> right, right, right. board chain um, at the start of the game by just playing tour guide. Um, but I think overall in the mid game, the efficiency of, mi of minions does tend to take over from hunter overall. Um, and even then, you saw the, the Gambit Elusia come out, but it was just too much board presence, too much power in play. And honestly, that mid-game arbor up 
for the Hunter, the Hunter version of Arbor Up, where you uh, go with the Warsong Wrangler and take Warpertinger, just ended up just being too many stats overall. It was, as I said, probably the best draw in the deck for RDU hmm. on that turn. And I think that's what really enabled the Snowball to the victory. Yeah, and to no one's real surprise, Casey's going to queue Shaman into Hunter. A very difficult matchup for Hunter here, uh, but still doable. It's just that Shaman does every single thing you don't want your opponent to do as the Hunter, right? They have options for AoE, they have options for relatively strong spot removal, but they also have high tempo plays on board in the early game. And those yep. are all things that Hunter does, does not want to see. Hunter wants to prey on all the decks that can't do at least some of those things. Yeah. And I do think this is where some of the differences in the lineup philosophy really comes into play as well, because Casey has more generic good decks, right? He's queuing Quest Shaman, which overall is one of the best decks in the metagame. Um, it is a good matchup against Hunter, but if you look at how this might have panned out in the alternative, say RDU lost game one to face Hunter, he'd be queuing Fell Demon Hunter right now, which in some circles might even be described as a 100% matchup against face Hunter, right? So you can see how the different dynamics come into play of how RDU is sacrificing um, some percentage overall, but he's sacrificing those percentages in matchups that he's not going to play because he's in control of the queue order a little bit more in last hero's down. See a very early perpetual flame there from Casey. Bald up with a minion as well, so that's just really strong. Not only has he removed the board, of course, from RDU, but okay. Uh, the fact that he gets to actually contest board going forward was a big deal. Yeah, and Casey, no issue on that turn with the overload in general, apart from the fact that Neophyte came down and punished him very, very hard. He did have the option to just coin a third overload on that turn to unlock immediately, but he felt because he had Lightning Bloom in hand that he could cast for zero anyway, there was no real reason to do that. But of course, that did open up the potential punish, which was exactly Colt Neophyte, which is what he got hit for. Uh, now, three turns later, is there anything you would like to talk about, Raven? I'm just wondering if they've slipped Nuzdormu in these decks or something, because <laughs> honestly, the Lightning... And uh, uh, what made me chuckle the most was Casey's just insta-pass on his full yeah. overload turn. As you said, he had options. It was just very funny. Casey does fight back, of course, and like I said, this is the issue. Spot removal as well as early tempo on board, right? He has this 3-3 coming out. He's probably going to coin out this um, Feral Spirit, I imagine. Okay, he's going for Charge Call. Wow, it's at seven. Okay. Get in. You won't. No. And that's not who is in the game. Hey. Makes sense. Called it. Aim shot, hero power, just rationing damage now. There really isn't any other way for Rally to go about this. And he's, Casey's just going to load up the extra minion on board. Hope he can dodge the five damage. RDU absolutely needs the one in three to go off here. Four. Worst one. Actually, maybe that was the second best one. Yeah, he can aim shot. Now RDU, right? Yeah, RDU can add a couple of turns to his own clock by taking care of the, uh, the AT. I guess that's the one redeeming factor, I guess, for the Hunter in this lineup and uh, matchup, sorry, is that the Rhino is normally very good against Shaman in general terms. Not so good against that minion, but still. <laughs> oh, sick. That's insane. I told you, Guardian Og Merchant's clutch. Oh. Imagine being RDU. Can you imagine it just for I a can't. second? I have trained for days. Imagine being Casey. <laughs> <laughs> Mark Spawn coming down now as well, safe in the knowledge that he'll be able to double anything he picks up on a following turn. Devolving missiles seems pretty clutch. No way a threatening board is going to be sticking around for too much longer here. Imagine being RDU. <laughs> <laughs> is that just it now? Every draw? Just imagine tennis. Yeah. You can see it slightly slipping away, although important to note that Casey does not have any healing as of yet. He can get some with Instructor Fireheart next turn, which I think is going to be the general plan if he doesn't just have lethal, of course. But it is a little bit... <laughs> a little bit closer. Play the Rhino, he pushes, rhino. Okay. pushes five, six with the one more. Mm -hmm. There's what, seven, nine? Casey needs to pull ten out of somewhere. Never he wants to take it now.
Fire heart for healing or damage. Investment? Investment, go again. Yep. Bloom is fantastic. Bloom, Tidal. Bloom, Tidal Wave. Oh, 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 get out the game. Wait for it. I do wait. Don't spit that water out. It. Okay, yeah, wait until he finishes drink. That was a good idea. And can see. It was really the perfect time for a spit take, really, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. It, I think if, if that was me drinking water and I saw that come down, I would have spat it out as well. Yeah. Casey, just like that. <laughs> so fast. It was close, though, right? And like, Adi, you did, uh, did get awfully close to setting that up. I think you put Casey to, what, five? Like, a lot of different spells off the top could have helped him out dramatically there to end it. Casey did have to go fishing for either lethal or some form of heal. Did get hold of it. And just like that, Casey takes the victory with the Shaman. The expected outcome, but not yes. the one that was necessarily going to happen in that specific game. Yeah, and this kind of goes back to what I was talking about, right? Like, you know, Casey doesn't really have guaranteed counter keys. He just has, you know, favorable percentages. The good stuff. He can queue into, yeah. He just has the good stuff. And Quest Shaman, yes, has a very good matchup against Face Hunter. But there is a failure rate, and it's a failure rate that we very no nearly saw there because of, what, three perfect draws in a row <laughs> from RDU? Divine Shield. Mwah. Yeah, Perfect. Um, but in the end, the uh, Instructor Fireheart, through which all things are possible, managed to dig Casey out of that one. You see the huge sigh of relief, because I think about turn five, he probably would have felt the game was over. And then turn seven, which was nine seconds later, he would have been feeling quite perturbed about what was going on based on the draws coming out from RDU. So I think that was a very genuine sigh of relief coming out there from Casey to have uh, dodged the worst thing that can happen to a person in Last Hero Standing, which is losing your counter queue matchup. Right. And uh, RDU now going to jump over to his rogue. And again, uh, I would say a fairly standard list apart from that one broom. Uh, RDU and, and I believe Tice are both running the same list on Rogue uh, with the one broom. You see yep. some value of it, especially in fighting back against some of these more board-focused decks, right? So even though I imagine the uh, the lovers of this Garot Rogue will be like, no, broom's pointless. It doesn't get us to the combo uh, as fast or than some other builds, maybe. I do see the merit, especially when you are looking at, uh, you know, the potential of these board-focused matchups. Yeah, still numerous innovations going on with this version of Rogue. No one really agrees on the list yet. We're seeing preps or no preps, pen flinger or no pen flinger, broom or no broom. Uh, even now the potential for a maybe not perhaps working as intended interaction <laughs> yeah. uh, going on with uh, with Talented Arcanist, which, you know, if it's working as intended, the uh, card is certainly worded wrong at the very least, but... Um, we will uh, explain, we'll, we'll jump over that hurdle if and when we come to it in Grandmasters, because for right now, not having an impact. But there's still, point being, still a long way to go, I think, to get this rogue to a place where, you know, even 80% of players agree on what the best list right. is. Right. And how much do you think Rogue needs to play for board or play a bit more of a tempo game plan. Do you think that's relevant against Shaman? Or is it really just the high level aggro decks that it should be scared of? Uh, I think the high level aggro decks is a good way to put it, yeah. I think obviously you cannot ignore board against Shaman. And I think uh, probably the best way to put it is that Shaman has hands that can force you into playing in a very anti aggro strategy, right? But the onus is on the shaman to do that and like this kind of board right now for example no great panic for rdu i think generally because shaman is a 30 class they're not going to go above 30. you can normally just pick a bar little bits and pieces of the board here and there maybe just use your dagger use a guardian orc merchant maybe to deal one damage to something in a clutch moment brain freeze here um and then your first field contact turn then you're dropping, you know, another brain freeze, a prize plunder, or whatever else. And right, then enough. because you can, yeah. then because you can shadow step a field contact quite freely in this matchup a lot of the time, you can then do that two more times over the course of the game, right? And really focus on getting those big tempo swings on your field contact turns, which then carry you to victory in the end. But now that's then. the one. Yep. <laughs> I've not seen it at all today, apart from now on that screen, but still. And triple lightning bolt, subtle. Uh, D might need to be more scared than he is right now. 
case he can somehow push Ooh. an additional 10. That is a good looking passage. Clear the board and develop fraud and one thief. Yeah, the Octo is the thing that's being passed up on this turn, right? More than likely? Apparently not. Oh, okay. I was kind of with you on the Foxy Fraud and do stuff turn. Mm -hmm. Just get to clean up the board, so it puts the pressure on Casey to say, well, can you do something with this Octo to clear it up? We can see that's a very easy yes, called Devolving Missiles, but did want to just put that forward. You had a reasonable hand to reduce. <laughs> And that is unlucky, right, that the answer is there. As we can see, there was actually several answers. I think the more common answer is spell damage plus a free damage spell to be able to answer your Octobot. Um, but I actually want to go back more and talk about the decision to go with the Octobot in the first place because, yes, Octobot discounts this hand, right? And this hand, if it draws a field contact, is going to go off. But until that moment, the discounts don't really matter that much, whereas... Going Foxy Fraud, uh, One Thief, for example, first off, you take more cards out of your passage that way, right? You play three yep. cards instead of two, so one less card goes back in. Secondly, One Thief can find you Spring Water, Arcane Intellect, Cram Session, etc., which can actually focus then on additional card draw to help you get towards your field contact. So for me, and I might be wrong in this regard, because again, opinions on how to play this deck differ wildly. I would have been more focused on optimizing draw potential towards field contact than I would have been thinking about discounting this hand at this point. Right. And interestingly enough, we'll have to see if RDU wants to shadow step this Octo. But if he doesn't, that's his reductions done for the game, right? Yes. Yes, it is. And he's only discounted the four mana from the Garots by one in total with a zero prep list, which makes his life very difficult when it comes to spending all of that mana on one turn. <laughs> what? Oh, he drew the overdraft! He drew the overdraft! Hang on! I think it's not lethal because he it unlocked. gets unlocked in the middle. Yeah. Use eyes, just getting wider. That's three, right? <laughs> that does three yeah, now. Okay, yes. Okay. I'm not sure if he went into the turn overloaded. If he went into the turn overloaded by at least one, that would have been lethal. If he didn't unlock in the middle, right? Because stupid had quest. <laughs> two extra locked mana crystals going into it. <laughs> what a disgusting turn! And now Ardu has no choice to respect every single board that Casey makes now if he can't lethal him back. Correct. Let's find a field contact though, that's a big deal. Oh. Too quiet. Cards Too in your original hand have to be a consideration now because all of these cards that you draw are going to go back into the original hand. means he does overdraw one now, right? Because he had six... Yep, he's going to go up yep. to exactly 10 on this turn. The overdraw in this position could be second field contact, Look at his right? Face. Oh. Could be on strike game. <laughs> <laughs> but even then, he was in a position where there's eight cards left in his deck. One of them was Shadow Step. One of them was field contact. Those were real, you know, bracket busters at that point yeah. in terms of even being able to be the uh, do the combo at that point which is not something I'm sure I think RDU pay particular attention to on his passage turn there's a uh, there's two habits that you do have to develop right if you want to get at least to a level of competency with this deck first off just learn all the rope memorization patterns that come with doing the lethal at the end right you need to get all of those reps under your belt and then there's two habits that you need to develop. One, counting your cards as you play them on any individual turn so you always know how much Prize Plunder is doing. Two, before you press Secret Passage, say to yourself, five cards in hand, six cards right, in hand, yeah. four cards in hand. Every single time. Or even take a screenshot or something, right? Yeah, you know, right, if you just exactly, sat so you can right. even see what you've got in hand to see what's worth and what's not. Uh, I just love the fact that in that game, we just saw an instant lightning bolt, lightning bolt, lightning bolt <laughs> into, a, into overdraft face. Like, this is the Hearthstone I live for, Sotl. Uh, we're not going to be moving on, though. Uh, Casey has his Shaman, but RDU has Fell Demon Hunter, and I know uh, uh, you're a big fan of this deck, or at least you've played it a lot. Uh, are you feeling? Would you be feeling confident going into the Shaman uh, matchup with this deck? 
Uh, I mean, against a, a random opponent? Yes, sure. Uh, against Casey? Eh, eh. Against, against old Triple Lightning Bolt Casey? Yeah, <laughs> they call him old Triple Lightning Bolt. I've <laughs> been calling him that for years. Um, yeah, years. obviously Casey's a fantastic player, but matchup-wise, yes, I, I love this matchup, and I continue to think that this matchup is very favoured for the Demon Hunter. Um, and I think there are mistakes that people are making that is causing it to appear a little bit closer, certainly from the Demon Hunter side. I could hear the argument from very, very good Shaman players that the Shaman players are also making crucial mistakes that perhaps I'm not as aware of because I don't play as much of the Shaman. Um, but from my perspective, certainly, I still think this is a very, very strong matchup. For the Demon it's Hunter one of the overall. key mistakes they make not doing Arcanist uh, Fel Barrage. No! One of the key mistakes people make is doing Arcanist Felbright. I feel like this is a point that very that needs very heavily clarifying. Because I've said multiple times, it's the most fun play in Hearthstone. But the reason it's the most fun play in Hearthstone is that you very rarely get to do it. And I see way too many people just doing it. And then their opponent like plays a giant or something. Like, well, nothing I could have done about this. I don't have any way to remove Look, this. I player. read the like, instruction manual. It says, <laughs> if you can, you should. So I did it and now I've lost. <laughs> Instruction manuals wrong. <laughs> but yes, as tantalizing as it is, I think Arcanist Fel Barrage is sometimes a play that needs to be resisted and some restraint needs to be shown in a lot of matchup. This being one of them, Handlock being one of them as well, where it's incredibly tempting. But then you get into that giant dynamic that I talked about before, and also the mirror as well, particularly if your opponent is playing Ilganoth, uh, is something that you have to consider as well. Yeah, so far though, Casey, while we've talked for approximately five seconds, half the game has gone yep. by. Casey yep. going pretty wide on board. Has this torrent to just remove this 4-3 without much effort. Might go for Perpetual here instead. That does, uh, okay, it just progresses quest by one. Makes sense if you can get a decent perpetual off in a matchup where it's not expected to clear a wide board, then why not just take the one overload progression? So I don't mind it. I do like this sort of bored, distant, vacant look that RDU has on his face right now because I think this encapsulates the feeling while you're playing against Shaman with this deck while they're building boards and dealing damage in the early game. As you kind of sit there like, yeah, okay, this is cute, but it's all entirely meaningless. I will choose to clear this up if and when I am ready. Right. You don't quite understand how pointless everything you're doing is yet, but it absolutely is. And RDU still has plenty of time here Ooh. to be uh, getting on with things. You could even stall for time potentially a little bit longer even because of the Aldraki Warblades, but he's just going to choose to do everything in combination to get the full board. Clear. Yeah, you I can see... Just as a point of reference, this doesn't make it wrong. Like, there is a little bit of overhealing going on this turn, which, you know, sometimes you can consider milking a little bit more, but he didn't really have anything impactful to do otherwise that turn. So uh, I, I agree in the end with just clearing up the board. Yeah, I was just wondering whether he could have just, just gone Warblades with the Chaos Strike and then right, yeah, yeah, been yeah, greedy, which is obviously what you were talking about. Yeah. Uh, I, I think I would have lent to, to have been a bit more greedy there, but again, as you mentioned, he would have just floated man and passed. He's trying to get this skull down as quickly as possible, so he actually is hoping this is a playable card. Or do you think he can work from the left here, Sotl, instead? Do you think that should I be a priority it, for him? I think it's either going to be... Six mana draw three from the middle of the hand or it'll be played from the left. Yeah. Right. Most likely played from the left, I would imagine. Oh, especially with a nice cheap metamorphosis now. He doesn't need to worry too much about Moog's being win conditions. He should be able to get there purely with Jace at this point, I would imagine. Okay, see again. Smartly just cashing in the flame. Just for the one overload. Progresses the quest. He's very rapidly getting to some strong options here. Snap picks, I imagine, the Wind Fury. Yep, makes sense. As you said, nice. e even boards like this are very clearable for Fell Demon Hunter. This is what the deck does. Yes, and specifically for Fell Barrage, right? Sorry, it's time to hop. It's time to hop on the barrage carriage, all right, Raven? Choo-choo all aboard the barrage mm. carriage. It's Mohawk Mohawk Fell Barrage this turn can actually clear it all up. Well, now you give me mixed signals, Sol, because I said barrage earlier. Now you're saying barrage, and I don't know what to say anymore. <laughs> I'm so it's bar Okay, it's barrage. We'll stick with it, but I will continue to make fun of you. The fact That's that fine. you used to say barrage. <laughs> Because that's just funny. I am hilarious. I think that's true. Yeah.
Choosing to use an Immolation Aura instead of a second Moog there is interesting. It's it's only because more options for Fell Scream though, right? It does give him more options for Fell Scream, yes, but also I think Immolation Aura is the single best card in the matchup. Um, and he still has a another Talented Arcanist left remaining, for example, that could pair quite nicely with it. So I think that was a tough decision. Because um, obviously Fell Barrage dealing two damage, double by one Moog to four, double by the second Moog to eight, would have been able to have uh, cleared up the board as well, which is the play that immediately leapt out to me. But Artie, you did choose to divert in the end. You know what play immediately leaps out to me, Sol? Tempo Ilgnath. Hmm. I don't hate it. It's I'm a big fan of just getting the big boy on board, honestly. <laughs> we can see, obviously, a torrent is going to be rough for that play. But still, Ardu uh, looks like to be f he's favoring just opening up that skull on the far left. Mm -hmm. Job done. Yeah, I honestly wouldn't have hated it. Because I think you, we can see there's there's been too, way too many win conditions, uh, or part, too many parts of the Ilkanoth win condition used up at yeah. this point, yeah. right, to even think about using it as an OTK. So I wouldn't have hated it there, but I think for quite a number of turns, RDU has been trying to engineer this skull from the left-hand side instead. And is Jace the main goal of the skull at this point? Does he need to fish for anything else? Obviously, extras are bonuses, but is he really just digging, looking to get Jace straight off this skull? I mean, Jace would, of course, be the nuts, but also additional Jace tools. So, yes, those what kinds of things. Skulls. <laughs> <laughs> those kind of things with uh, Fel Barrage and Fury, right? Like, you, you're going to want your Jace to OTK at this point, which is quite likely um, when you're whittling your opponent down to a very mid-rangey uh, health total to begin with, and you're going to get the refresh on the Metamorphosis coming out from your Jace when you do eventually get it. So uh, picking up the Fury and so on here, I think it's very nice. And Ardu, of course, going to respect the Brakan. When that thing, if it lives, can just get Wind Fury, it's uh, time to be afraid. And now this is probably Never. last chance for Casey to do something massively impactful before uh, Ardu is going to be digging through that deck, trying to find the Jace. Does have another three mana skull, which again might end up just being cast from the middle of the hand for three cards, especially since it costs three and that doesn't even feel that bad to do in that position. But I think most importantly, he can't waste too many turns trying to set up another outcast skull here, right? Like if he draws Jace for eight, cool. We'll draw Jace for eight and play it for eight, you know? I was a little bit surprised Casey didn't go for Diligent Note Taker there before the charge call. Just to guarantee a second very strong play next turn. Right, what have we got, Raven? Not enough to get Pro through four twelves. Probably not going to matter because he's not getting through the four twelves. Yeah, is the problem. Really yes. good pick in up, terms, Casey. In terms of raw damage, if he played Fury this turn, that's four. It would then get double to eight. There's a Chaos Strike for ten. Bell barrages going face twice would do eighteen. Metamorphosis coming back, twenty-two would be damage output, I think. There's still another Fury, another Chaos Strike left remaining in the deck, I think, that can add damage. But as for now, the must-have card is Talented Arcanist, I believe, right? To even approach the idea of being yep. able to clear this board state up. Double Moa gone, of course, which is a bit of a problem here for our degree. Yeah, the Dari Studies can do some work here as well. Chaos Leech would be a useful tool. And even Good a chunk uh, of removal. Even if he got hold of the second Aldraki, right, like with double Fury, it would do something. <laughs> like he could retain health and start hacking away at these dragons. Gonna drop the second Immo into the pool. So in terms of removal now, he has two Fell Screen Blasts, two Immolation Auras, two I Beams in the pool that can help shoot these taunts out of the way. Which is very helpful. I was wondering instead whether maybe he went for the Fury there instead, just to be able to take like uh, one of them down, reduce the number of targets that he'd need to deal with. That probably doesn't make sense. I think Ardy, you will need the Fury damage to go face here. Um, and because so much of your removal in the Jace is AoE based anyway, you're probably going to kill both or neither of these minions, right? Unless specifically both of your recast I beams just hit the Yeah, like a perfect, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so you're going to grab the heal, which makes sense. It's not like he needs more stuff on board, right? He just take the lifesteal while you can. Mm -hmm. Get that little bit safer if there's any kind of shenanigans. 
I bet Radu wish he was playing the other version of this list so he could duplicate Jace's at this point. <laughs> yeah, I don't know whether he would have found the time to do that, though, is the problem. But he certainly hasn't found the time to play that Elganoth up till now, which would be the uh, direct replacement in this position. So he can go Aldraki double Fiori this turn, right? And just kill the Pan. Or at least reduce down the big boy. Demons. It would Demons. kill the 410, right? You kill the 410, yeah. yeah. Heals like the most realistic way to get through this. He heals back up, of course. And everything else is killable for Jace, right? Uh, at least to clear the board at a minimum. Yep. And then the big target left on the board is the 4-7, so you'd be looking for Immos and Felscreen to go off first next turn with the Jace, and then hope that the I-beams hit the targets you're looking for. Okay. Now, Casey, and really, I imagine just refills, right? 12 from Note-Taker Serpent Shrine. All his mana at that point. He would have got there, right, with one more mana if he was able to overload at the end of the turn. Hmm. Wait, does he still get there? Wait, he gets eight. He'll be overloaded. One. Two. If you just if you just unlock first, you can go spell damage. Note take right. Wait, you spend he... one. You spend one mana to unlock two, and then you can go novice zapper, diligent note taker, serpent shrine, serpent shrine. Can you not? I want to say yes. Hmm. Oh, does it work if you just do Let's it? Do it anyway. Oh, oh yeah, okay, this works too. Before, right? Yeah, because yeah, yeah, the yeah, overload. Yeah, yeah, that was. It's always tricky when you don't have the overload in front of you as well, like just visually yes. to really just get get it right in your head. But forget all about that. Congratulations to Casey. We said going into this week he was one of the players we had our eyes on to really need a strong win. And not even just this one. This is the first step, I would say. But I think Casey should have his sights on at least top four this week uh, just to try and just secure those three points and propel him forward into more of a mid-table scenario. Really strong win for him there. And uh, just a good victory over RDU, I think. Pretty solid. Yeah, good spot at the end. Uh, I'm pretty sure my way works as well, but he found a way, so no reason to really question it, right? As Sotl's way or the a way, apparently. <laughs> if you see a play that gets lethal and you execute it, then congratulations. You have fulfilled your obligations as a Hearthstone player. But yeah, really sticky spot in the end, really coming from those 412 taunts. Um, from one doubled up charge call, I think you're within your rights to hit one Sleepy Dragon, right? I think that's very reasonable, but hitting double there became a huge problem for RDU yeah. because, again, even if there was only one huge taunt, the Feral Spirits don't matter. They're not there. They don't exist. The only reason they exist is that they can soak damage from Fel Barrages or I-Beams if they go off too fast in the chain. But it was the double taunt that was the real big problem, the double huge taunt, which meant the I-Beams weren't really going to be enough to get through there. And I think it's a problem that's appeared more and more since people haven't been running Chaos Leech in the deck, is that your big spot removal for big minions just doesn't really exist anymore, particularly on your Jace turns. Right. Um, so I'm, you know, since slightly curious about whether we might just be sneaking another Chaos Leech back into the deck at some point. That big Group C this week, honestly. Fel Kane going into this week, one point. Casey going yep. into this week, three points. Many people going into this week above six points, you know. So it's a really big week for these two here getting through the group. And of course, they'll both be looking to gain more and more points with their more wins going forward from tomorrow onwards. But yeah, just a strong week for Casey, strong week for Falcane there. And that is going to be our 